Okay. Good evening, everyone in City of Harrisburg. Welcome to Harrisburg City Council work session. Today is Tuesday, February 2nd, 2021. My name is Wanda R.D. Williams. I'm chair and all of City Council and members. I'm now calling this meeting to order at 5.32 p.m. Mr. Petrosky, please do the roll call. Mr. Allett. Present. Ms. Bowers. Present. Ms. Daniels. Present. Ms. Green. Mr. Madsen. Here. Mr. Majors. Ms. Williams. Present. Thank you, Mr. Petrosky. And for the record, uh, Ms. Green is not available tonight. She is excused. We'll now move on to committee business. We now will open up with Budget and Finance Committee. Mr. Alec. Yes, good evening. Thanks everybody for being here tonight. Um, I know that um, we have Bill 1 up for dis uh, discussion for tonight. Uh, Kirk, do you wanna go ahead and read that into record? Sure, uh, Bill 1 of 2021 is an ordinance authorizing the city of Harrisburg to negotiate and enter into a six agreements, uh, six agreement sale with Manufacturers and Traders Trust Company for the purchase of, purpose of acquiring the real property and improvements there on located at 1002 North 7th Street in the city of Harrisburg and further authorizing for negotiation entering into a lease agreement for the purpose of and continued operation of an on-site dispensing machine. Very good. Do we want to start with you, Wayne, or with Tiffany? Who wants to begin uh, with this discussion tonight? Uh, Wayne Martin here. I can certainly begin, Mr. Chairman. Um, we gave a presentation uh, late 2020 uh, discussing the uh, positions that would relocate. That would be the city engineers, uh, uh, administrative assistant, project manager, engineering reps, uh, traffic manager and the uh, traffic signal technicians. Uh, we went through the five reasons to relocate, uh, one being the 83 expansion, uh, which is going to decrease the size of the public works facility, the obvious expansion of our public works department, including um, taking on additional uh, sanitation accounts. Uh, the fact that the engineering department is currently located in multiple buildings, um, we're, you know, se separated, and that our equipment is uh, currently stored in five separate locations. So this opportunity uh, came to the city uh, to purchase a, a building for approximately $300,000 under the appraised value. We would utilize the first floor of the building for the uh, traffic traffic shop uh, where we store street lights, traffic signal equipment, and signage and our sign making uh, equipment. And the upper floors would be used for uh, the office spaces and additionally, uh, there's some space available that we would utilize for uh, construction inspection uh, personnel, which uh, we were able to save some significant money this year by excluding uh, field office in um, some of our capital projects as required um, or as typical by um, you know, multi uh, these transportation programs, mm -hmm. grants and whatnot. So um, with that, uh, Dave Baker's here uh, to talk about any questions regarding the fit out and Tiffany Baldock deputy solicitor is on to um, discuss any timelines associated with the settlement or um, uh, any, you know, uh, contract negotiation matters. Uh, my first question actually is just for Tiffany by way of process. I, I know we went through this at the end of the last year, but it was not accompanied at the time with the bill, correct? So this is the first time we're seeing this by way of legislation yes. coming down. Okay. And yep, then that's correct. So because this is essentially um, the first review of this, do we have to have this appear on the agenda one more time in a committee session prior to moving to a vote? No, so this is this is the, um, it was introduced at your first legislative session um, mm -hmm. at the end of January. You had to wait at least three days because it's an ordinance. Um, so this counts, this is your public review and then next week you can put it to an actual vote. Okay, perfect, I just wanted to make sure. Um, I, I mean, based on our discussion at the end of December um, on this, has anything changed by way of things that we want to make sure we pointed out for council um, at this point, or is it pretty much straightforward based on what we discussed in December? Everything um, remains the same. The appraisal came back on the building at $675,000. The city will be paying uh, M&T Bank $375,000 to acquire the building. 
And then MNC Bank is giving us a $300,000 credit. And once we approve this bill um, and the timeline from there, um, we go ahead and, and approve the real estate transfer essentially. And then at what point uh, are we, would we propose or suspect that we would take actual ownership of the building? We are looking to settle very quickly. Um, so once you vote and if it's approved, um, we are, which hopefully would be uh, February 9th, um, and assuming we have a title search that's ongoing right now, it's due back any day, assuming there's no issues with that title search, we look to close and settle within a week. So we are targeting um, the week of February 16th. Okay, gotcha. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, I'm okay at this point because I, I, none of this is new to me because we've had these discussions ongoing um, for some time, but I will open up to questions. I'm going to go down to what would be the end of the day is typically and go to council member Bowers with any questions that you might have. I don't have any questions. Thank you. I was just curious about the timeline and any updates since we last saw the bill. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Council member Madsen. Uh, no questions for me at this point. I guess one question I guess I do have is um, I know that around there, especially during uh, rush hour in the mornings and evenings around M&T Bank, uh, we can get a lot of traffic volume. I guess um, any thoughts or considerations into that um, since constituents will need to use it and particularly probably from multiple um, municipalities now? Maybe that's a question for Wayne. Uh, yeah, I assume that uh, that would be for me. Uh, Traffic volumes regarding the, the use of the ATM machine, is that what the concern or just the North 7th Street corridor? North 7th Street corridor. So uh, ironically, we do have the project on North 7th Street. Um, we do anticipate additional traffic flows, uh, particularly when the 2nd Street um, you know, goes two-way on that corridor. And so the uh, traffic signal improvements there um, are designed not mostly for pedestrian safety. They will actually have uh, a traffic calming effect, so they'll slow traffic. However, uh, since we are shortening crosswalk distance and things, we will improve capacity on that corridor slightly, at least in the northbound direction. Um, uh, after studying that corridor, the northbound will need three lanes northbound long before uh, we ever need that second southbound you know, North 7th Street Lane. So, um, you know, with the oncoming project, I think it'll improve. Our our uh, department actually um, will have a lot less traffic demand on that building than than M and T um, Bank had. We our uh, traffic signal department starts at six thirty a.m. Uh, and you know they're done by two. Uh, well, three 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 thirty um, before the you know the the bulk of the um, rush hour traffic. So I, you know, I don't anticipate any, any issues associated with um, the use of the building now post-construction during construction, that that'll be another story that uh, everyone will have to work with us on that. But after construction, I think we'll be fine. Okay. And then uh, one follow-up question is, I know it was mentioned before that what's triggering this move is the IED one expansion. I know we uh, tried to do a study to try and um, provide that to PennDOT, I guess while we're on sort of that topic, did that have any effect or did that do any, did that help sway um, PennDOT's opinion on the expansion? So um, I-83 is, is, you know, moving on. Um, they're doing their appraisals now of the various, uh, you know, takings. Uh, we were not able to uh, convince PennDOT to minimize the scope of the you know, the footprint of the taking. Uh, however, they were amenable to a lot of the uh, recommended improvements on the crossings. Um, so we've negotiated um, some lighting improvements uh, to the various crossings. So we're talking where Paxton goes under 83, 13th um, goes over 83, um, 17th goes under 83, 19th goes uh, over 83. So we were able to negotiate wider sidewalks in those cases, uh, bicycle amenities in some, some of the locations um, and, and improved lighting. So it wasn't exactly what, it wasn't all of what we had hoped for, but, um, and, and, you know, they did compromise in, in, in some ways. And those 
improvements and changes are available on the project website on PennDOT's uh, website. Okay, thank you. That's it for me. Thank you, uh, Council President. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Alec, did you say me? Yep, it's you. Pardon me? Yes, you. Okay, okay, I didn't know, I, I couldn't hear you. I, I'm <laughs> okay, um, Wayne, I just have a couple questions. Could you just give us the terms of the repayment that we are going to be doing with uh, M&T Bank, just the repayment terms? Can you give us an idea of the $300,000 credit that they extend to us? What would be the terms of repayment? How many years, at what percentage, and at what cost? Um, and Williams, if I may, this is Tiffany. Um, it is, we're doing a $375,000 cash payment to M&T. Right. I know. Um, yes. And then they are just taking $300,000 off, off the price and they are taking it as a credit. So there is no repayment, no terms. Oh, we, oh, we just great, pay the $375,000 and we own the building outright. Okay. Thank you. Is there a rental fee that's going to be assessed to um, M&T Bank for the usage of the, the ATM machine there? There will be no rental fee, and that's due to uh, the consideration they have given us with the $300,000 credit. I believe the ATM, um, it is a 20-year, I think it's a 20 or 25-year uh, rental agreement, lease agreement for them. Okay. I don't have the legislation in front of me, Tiffany. That's why okay. I choose questions. Sure. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Allen. All right, thank you. And um, Council Member Daniels. I have any questions that have already been asked. All right, and I saw Council Member Majors has joined. Uh, we are actually discussing uh, Bill uh, 1 of 2021 about the uh, uh, sale of the M&T building to Public Works. Did you have any questions for Wayne, Tiffany, or Dave at this time? Uh, no, no questions. I, I think, um, you know, had an opportunity to, to tour the building when we were look, first looking at this. And um, I think the terms are uh, favorable for, for, for the city right now with, as uh, Tiffany mentioned about the uh, $300,000 credit that we're gonna be uh, providing to them and only have to spend 375,000 for the building. Um, so uh, no, I, I think I'm good with, uh, with everything as it stands right now. Okay. All right, thank you, Wayne and Dave and Tiffany for your assistance on this. I will go ahead and move this and recommend this for the agenda for next Tuesday's uh, legislative session. So thanks so much. Uh, that concludes the finance tonight. I can turn it back to you, Council President. Well, thank you, Mr. Alec. And now we'll turn it over to Councilwoman Bowers, uh, who heads the Building and Housing Committee, Ms. Bowers. Thank you, President Williams. You're welcome. Good evening, everyone. So. Uh, before we begin our discussions of Bill 16 and 17, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank um, the members of the Affordable Housing Task Force, Ms. Nona Watson, Mr. Jeffrey Knight, and Mr. Jamal Jones for all of their assistance. Um, I would also like to thank the administration and the solicitor's office for their assistance as well. So we know that Bill 16 and 17 are part of a four bill uh, legislative package addressing affordable housing within the city. Um, bill 16 is the focal point of the package as it establishes the affordable housing program. Um, Mr. Petrosky, could you please read Bill 16 into the record? Sure, Bill 16 of uh, 2020 is an ordinance amending the codified ordinance of the city of Harrisburg, adding there to Title 12, entitled Affordable Housing, establishing incentives for development of affordable dwelling units through the use of affordable housing development certifications and agreements, authorizing the promulgation of rules and regulations to establish and maintain affordable housing programs and imposing fines and penalties for willful non-compliance with program requirements and agreements. Thank you. I believe Ms. Nona Watson is present on behalf of the administration to discuss Bill 16. Good evening, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Council Member Bowers. I am very excited. I don't 
know if I'm going to actually, we also have Tiffany um, here with us who will actually go into detail about the bill. But I just wanted to say that um, I'm very excited about this affordable housing um, program that we want to establish. Um, when I first came to the city, the first thing that the mayor said to me was, we have got to have an affordable housing program. And, and it was just so awesome as well, because I think council member Bowers, you were the first person that I met from council. And when you came up to me, you said the same exact thing that the mayor said to me in reference to affordable housing. So I thought, okay, that's good. We're all on the same page and we can make this work. So um, just to let you know what we have done so far is um, we've started doing the research as you stated, we formed the um, Affordable Housing Task Force. Um, I've been able to rely on everyone for information and to help with the research. Um, I also had an opportunity to speak with approximately 12 um, members of the development community um, to kind of bounce things off of them because as I always say at the end of the day, we want to make sure that whatever it is that we put out there, that it is actually going to work, that it is actually going to make a difference. I was able to also um, do some research and reaching out to different municipalities to see exactly what it is that they're doing. So I, I just wanted to gather up all the information because what we want is to see what would actually be a good fit for us. Um, also worked hand in hand with Jeffrey. He has been amazing. His expertise has just been great and helpful. Um, met with uh, uh, council member Bowers and council member Madsen to get feedback um, from them as well. So I just think we are well on our way. Um, to establish this affordable housing program. Um, so with that being said, I'll turn it over to Tiffany, if that's okay. Good evening, everyone. So you have in front of you um, Bill 16 of 2020, and this is gonna be the mechanism by which developers can qualify for the affordable housing program. They would apply with the city. Um, they would have to receive a certificate of qualification, which is based on um, a set of criteria. Some of that criteria includes um, if you're building a development and you want to qualify for affordable housing, at least 20% of your dwelling units have to be um, available for affordable housing. In addition to that, the ordinance also lays out certain standards that are gonna be required of the affordable housing dwelling units, such as they need to be comparable to any market rate units. So you can't have um, an affordable housing unit, say that does not have air conditioning or has different heat elements or things like that. They need to be very similar to what's being offered uh, as the market rate units. Um, trying to see, additionally, it requires uh, that if you qualify and you get a certificate of qualification, your affordable housing dwelling units need to remain affordable for a period of not less than 10 years. Um, this 10 year period was decided on based on the 10 year period that's outlined, outlined in our LERDA ordinance. So it, it mirrors LERDA. Um, I'd like to point out this is a starting point. So obviously um, amendments um, may be made. Uh, some of these decisions, you know, we put in there not, not completely um, knowing what everyone is gonna want. Um, additionally, if you're a developer and you qualify, you are gonna have to sign a developer's agreement, which will be filed um, in the recorder of deeds, putting a restriction on the property. So um, you can't you know, qualify for the affordable housing program um, and then sell it to someone and they try to undo the affordable housing. There's also a mechanism within the ordinance that provides for fines if you are willfully violating um, the ordinance, if you've, you've qualified for the affordable housing program and you're getting incentives, we wanna make sure that each year you are, follow, you are follow, filing um, a certificate of compliance. And um, all of that, I think Mayor, uh, is gonna go through NONA at this point. It would go through the Office of Community and Economic Development. 
trying to think what else may be in here. Does anybody have any questions at this point? So once, oh, go ahead, sorry. I, I, well, I don't know if this, this section to chime in, but uh, as I'm reading through the legislation, when we get to the enforcement piece, I just have some questions there. Sure. So Bill 16 creates the framework, uh, the mechanism for qualifying for the program. Right now, this is geared towards rental dwelling units. Um, we created it in such a way that incentives can be added down the road, um, perhaps building in um, incentives for um, home buyers. Um, you know, affordable housing isn't just uh, for rental units. We should make affordable housing available to those first time home buyers, especially. Um, let me see. So once you qualify under Bill 16, that's when we get into the other three companion bills, one being Bill 17, which is some zoning relief. And then we also have some lure relief and street vacation relief, which will be discussed at a future work session. Thank you, Tiffany, for, for providing that overview. I see my colleagues have some hands raised, so um, sure. I'll now <laughs> open it up for questioning. Um, let's see, uh, Vice President Allen, I saw your hand first. Thank you. Tiffany, so in the development of this too, I know some concepts that have been up for discussion in the past were centered around, are developers required to have a certain percent um, that has to be affordable housing? I see some percents about like the cost of what they can charge based on income levels. Um, but is there anything in terms of a minimum, like if a developer is putting in a 10 unit, you know, project, is there a requirement that exists? And I was trying to go through and see, and I couldn't yes. tell. So Absolutely. So you're required to have a minimum of 20% of your units be uh, affordable housing. So if you were putting in 10 units total, at least two of them would need to be set aside for affordable housing. Got you. And then on top of that, is there a minimum, like would they have to be putting in 10 units to have that 20% apply? Like, is there a certain minimum that that would be? No, there was no minimum as far as scale of the overall project. So yes, you, you could be doing so three units. Yeah. yeah, three units, and then yes. one of them would have to be. Correct. And if someone was just putting in two units? <laughs> You're still at one. <laughs> so no matter what, if someone's building a multi-unit project, then one of them has to be earmarked if it's under that threshold. Correct. Okay. Thank you. That's. <clears throat> Can I just jump in and uh, clarify? Uh, so uh, that you, you have to do that to qualify for an affordable for housing, uh, you know, certification and to qualify for the bonuses. We're not forcing developers to, uh, you know, to have to build affordable housing. It's a, it, it's a different thing. I just wanted to make sure that, that people listening understood that distinction. Yes, but I, I think that's important because I think if developers want to have that be part of the process, they have to understand what their what the expectations on them would be, particularly if it's a small project. Because I can see a lot of smaller developers wanting to do this and participate, but they need to understand, you know, exactly what they're what they're getting out of it as well. So, no, thank you. That answers my question. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, while we're on the topic of developers, I do have a question for Ms. Watson. I was just curious, um, you talked about your outreach to at least like a dozen local developers. I was curious to know what feedback you received regarding the bill or package. I'm not sure um, what all you shared. Uh, so if you could speak to that a little bit more. Yes, um, the feedback was, it was very good. Um, they pretty much gave us more ideas, which some we incorporated in the, the bill. Um, but at that time when I met with them, we were not quite there. So um, some of them were going to go back and look at some of the projects that they had already done to see if they applied what we put together, if it would actually make a difference. So overall, they were all very excited. Um, so, but they also knew that this was a work in progress and that we're going to keep on, you know, trying to build uh, this legislation, so. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let's see, Councilwoman Daniels, do you have any questions? 
Yes, um, I have a few. Um, the first one is uh, Ms. Baldock, if you could clarify what line 133, well, maybe it's like more like 136, um, explaining section 12-101.6 subsection B, what that means in relationship to the 20%? Well, so um, that section applies to what we want to prevent is if a developer comes in and say they're building 10 units and they set, a set, they set aside two for affordable housing and they're getting relief. What we want to prevent is them building the market rate units first and holding off on the affordable housing until the very last piece. So we want the affordable housing units to be developed at the same rate as the market rate units. Um, and if they don't do that, we would hold back um, the last 15% of the market rate units. Um, and, you know, again, we're percentages were sort of, you know, we, we could bump that up to 20%. Um, you know, we went with 15%. Um, so if you were, if you build all your market rate units, we would not let you have a certificate of occupancy until at least one of those affordable housing units was built okay. and ready for a tenant to take possession. Okay, thank you. Um, and the penalties under section 12-101.99 um, between $50 and $1,000, like what was the rationale between that number? Like for that number, how did, you guys come up with the idea that that was like a good enough of an um, I think that's in line with some of our other um, ordinances that provide for violations is where we came up with the $1,000, not not to exceed $1,000. Um, I think that that's the the most under any of our ordinances that, that we can find someone. And then, um, uh, I think for our, for kind of for our protection, um, I would like to see language defining, because at the beginning you have affordable housing as 30% of someone's income, but then the rest of the document um, refers to affordable housing as the HUD guidelines. Um, okay. And they, uh, you know, so it, it kind of reads you know, if I'm someone reading it, it reads, if I'm a developer and I'm new to developing, um, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm having, to, you know, it, it, it'll be more helpful if it's more consistent. Um, sure. And I, I think some of this was left um, so that the program can be developed um, administratively. So Nona would be developing an application and coming up with some regulations um, that, that would uh, tighten some of this. So developers would completely know exactly what rents they can charge, um, you know, what those income limits are definitively. And we would anticipate that that, that is something that would come out of Nona's office. And then um, the other portion. So this is, in, the primary enforcer is the city. Did you all consider having the beneficiaries also be enforcers? Are you talking about so the, the tenants themselves? Right. I would anticipate that if, and I would hope that if a tenant, you know, is in one of these affordable housing units that's qualified under here, that they would submit a complaint um, if they were being overcharged or perhaps their unit was not being kept up the same way the market rate units are. Um, so maybe that's something out of Nona's office as well that we establish a complaint procedure. Yeah, and I think maybe that should be in the resolution, like in the ordinance itself, so that way the tenant, it's a right and it's not something we're doing because we're nice, you know, like because no one is being nice that day kind of thing. Um, so, so I think that would be valuable to have. Um, and then, you know, I didn't go through the other ordinance uh, that thoroughly, but does this mean that the street vacations then um, will only, will be restricted to only the development or, I mean, that, this no. is just one of the benefit. This is just one of the reasons is, for street vacations. Yes. Um, with the street vacation, there's just, in, it's just an incentive 
for developers. If they also need a street vacation, if they're doing affordable housing, they get some incentives with the street vacation. Okay, because um, in this in this bill, it, it reads like that's the reason for the street vacation, but I didn't read the street vacation ordinance fully yet. So, um, okay, um, and then. Yeah, so did y'all play around with the, you know, because the HUD um, median income, you know, is, it's a Har it's a Harrisburg Carlisle. Yes. MSA. So that income is pretty high. I mean, I think I, I haven't checked the numbers in the last like two years, but, you know, in Harrisburg, 94% of our families in the school district are, um, you know, are receive, um, you know, the free lunch program, which is an indication of the level of the income that, you know, that 94, 90 plus percent of our families are dealing with. And the, the HUD income, the, the region is richer um, and larger than, than Harrisburg is. So it skews a little so that this is Still a little bit of this, this these guidelines are, would still be a hardship for one of our families in the school district to, to meet. Because, um, you know, for example, like the a family of three would have to make like sixty one thousand under sixty one thousand two hundred dollars. Um, and we know a lot of our families, you know, are not meeting that income. So so did you all consider developing um, using a different median income, like maybe just using Harrisburg or some other source. Yes, and that was probably uh, one of the more difficult, challenging aspects of this is what measure do we use? Is it MFI, median family income? Do you use AMI, the average median income? What we found is affordable, when talking about affordable housing, um, people use MFI um, pretty much across the board. Additionally, our DBHD department uses MFI out of, out of HUD for the home program. So we were trying to keep it consistent, you know, across city programs. Um, with that said, I do believe out of DBHD, the MFI gets adjusted. Um, and I can speak with uh, uh, the acting interim director, Lily, about that in a little bit more detail um, about what those adjusted numbers look like. Um, can I jump in, please? Sure. Okay, so um, the 85,000 um, Councilwoman Daniels that you see is not the number that HUD actually used. I mean, they use it to determine what the income limits are going to be. But it's, like say- the, I, I, didn't, I didn't send 85,000. The, the number I used was a three person family, which I, I don't know, I'm just assuming someone has a kid and that's 61,200. Right, but like I have here the income limit. So for, um, for you, you said the 68,000? Uh, I was just, it doesn't matter which one you use. I, I, was, I just pulled the three person family. Okay, so it also just depends on what category they're in. So if it is a very low income uh, family, um, it's actually for three people is 38,000 according to HUD's income guidelines. So this is what the DBHD uses as well. Right, but the, you know, the, I think, I mean, I think for practical purposes, I don't want to jinx it, but I don't think um, the folks needing the very low income or extremely low income will benefit too much from these because then their rents are going to be um, I, I don't know, just based on what people charge here for rent, I just don't see. Well, I do also know when Jeffrey did the, um, the write up on this and Jeffrey, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we actually used for this city 43,000. Um, that was the number that we used. Am, am I correct, Jeffrey? 43,333, something like that? Um, I would, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I would have to look at the 
exactly which numbers we use. I know we had kind of the same. I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. No, no, the, the volume is like low. Oh, um, I'm using a new, uh, sorry, I'm using a new um, uh, speaker with the camera here. So I'm not exactly sure how to turn it up. Uh, <laughs> so apologies for that. I'll try and talk up a little bit. Um, so we had the same uh, issues that uh, Tiffany noted uh, in you're dealing with different data sets a lot of times and it's when can you get the data so that it's the most current and how do you apply it to like things like HUD. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that we made a recommendation on that. I think that was something we let uh, Nona decide and kind of as Nona said, uh, we tried to, I think, blend it with what uh, DBHD does. Um, so, you know, I would say that if, if we have a uh, if we have standards that DBHD is already using, it makes the most sense to continue to follow those. Right. I think, you know, it, it, on an organizational perspective, that makes sense. But this isn't, you know, that those thresholds are, you know, defined by the feds because it's their money and it's their, you know, whatever goals they have. Um, this is an incentive that's purely based on assets and resources that the city will be leveraging. Um, so I think it's perfectly reasonable for us to come up with something that's um, with, with the definition that's more reasonable for our population. Um, so because none of these are tied, from what I'm reading, none of this is tied to them complying with any kind of federal regs. It's just complying with our, whatever we come up with. unless they happen to be a large enough project that they're getting, you know, maybe some tax benefits or they're a private section eight builder or whatever, right? So unless they specifically choose to opt into a- Well, I will say that these are, this is the same information that HUD uses for its housing choice voucher program. Um, I'm just keeping that in mind. The Section 8 program, the home program, CDBG, they all use this. And those programs are to benefit low to moderate income individuals. Yeah, they, but those programs have, you know, they have requirements. They need to target, they need to specifically target very a certain percentage of very low income people, a certain percentage of extremely low income people, a certain percentage of low income people. Um, and then they also have other things. They supplement utilities. Um, you know, if if you know, so I said I don't I don't think they're. Um, you know, I, I like I said organizationally, I understand the logic of using a consistent number, um, but I feel like we are leveraging, you know, city assets, which is the, you know, which is the tax revenue we're going to lose, um, or, or not generate uh, for the period this this building is being abated. Um, so it's not unreasonable for us to, um, you know, to, to develop our own numbers that more closely match the population that we serve. Yeah, and I think, I think part of the issue, um, and again, I'm certainly not advocating we don't do that. And I, you know, I think I would let uh, Nona and uh, Lily uh, chime in too. But I think part of the issue too is that getting those numbers that are specific to Harrisburg can be a bit challenging um, because we are a smaller municipality. We don't get those, um, we don't get the census data and the ACS data uh, quite as uh, frequently as a place like maybe Philadelphia does. Um, so the data we may have might be further behind in terms of, uh, you know, even a couple of years. So um, it may be, it's kind of like, do we get more current information for a larger area or do we get more tailored information, but that's older? And, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's part of the trade-off that, that you have to consider when you're uh, weighing, you know, how you define these um, groupings. Yeah, and I think that's something maybe we could spend a little bit more time thinking about because, you know, um, if someone is, the reality is our program isn't going to be, I don't mean to be this pessimistic, but our program isn't going to be as heavily enforced as one that's tied to one of the federal programs, for example. Um, so, um, so in some ways it's an easier program to tap into if you're a developer. So that in and of itself is a slight benefit. Um, so, you know, 
So there are these things that are pros about it because I don't imagine this to be as administratively heavy as like, let's say a, a, a tax, uh, you know, a, a tax, I forget what it's called, um, but one of the IRS based affordable housing programs. So, um, so yeah, I, th I would like for folks to think about that. I don't have a good suggestion. I and mean, I don't know if our taxing our income tax um, provider would be a good resource or to help us come up with those numbers. But that's just something to think about. And I think that's it for me in terms of questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilman Madsen, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, a few. First, I just want to congratulate the task force and uh, Councilman Bowers for getting this together. Um, I was in the very preliminary phases of it um, and had some suggestions, so I'm glad that the committee uh, and took this into consideration. I see a lot of, very happy to see a lot of uh, targeted um, help for low to moderate income families, particularly those that do not qualify for federal subsidies. Really like that, uh, that we're uh, helping out that population. Um, so the question and, and that, and that the program is incentive based. I know that was something that um, when we were discussing ideas that that was uh, something we all kind of agreed upon. So I was happy to see that as well. Uh, my question falls around like uh, is around enforcement. Um, any sense on what an additional cost will be to the administration in terms of enforcement and then which department or bureau will the enforcement fall under? Is that building and housing or codes? Uh, I think that's going to be a, a policy decision. Okay. I guess a lot depends on how much it's being used, and I get that. Um, but I guess, I don't know who. And it may be, um, Councilman Madsen, it may be that it's more than one, um, more than one office. You know, we might get a complaint into code, so you could get a complaint into the zoning office. Um, Nona's office may uh, realize that somebody is out of compliance. So I, I would see it, you know, being a, a city effort. Okay, I think maybe I'd like to get a little bit more thought around that um, and how we enforce it um, and the mechanisms in place for that. I think it'd be easier, it was brought up before, if a constituent um, was thought they were being treated unfairly. They knew exactly which department to contact and how to address it and what the process was um, in case they encounter a bad actor. Um, and then there was a section in the language I wanted a little bit of clarification on around enforcement and that was section C. There's some of the verbiage that I don't quite understand. So I don't know if that can be explained in sort of more layman's terms. Do you have, um, a, do you have a line, a line number? Uh, I think starting at 215. Yeah, we'll go from there. Uh, prosecution. Mm -hmm. So some of this, um, you know, whether we have when you do your certification, if you're certifying under a penalty of law, you know, whether that's perjury, um, I, I think we kept it very broad to keep our options open as to what type, um, what type of remedy we would pursue. I think it would also depend on the nature of the, um, you know, why they're out of compliance if, you know, if they've been out of compliance for years and they're just running, you know, being very uh, willful and just trying to get one over on the city, or is it, the, you know, perhaps somebody just didn't file their paperwork in time, you know, so, so there's, there's different levels of um, remedies. It, you know, we usually tie it to whatever the offense may be and the gravity of that. Okay. And then uh, this question is for Jeff. Uh, I know we're gonna be reviewing the comprehensive plan here soon. Were any ideas or thoughts from the comp plan uh, implemented into this legislation? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly really an 
the overall approach, I think, uh, was um, the overall idea, frankly, uh, was brought into uh, this. And, you know, that was one of the main things we heard during our public engagement is just that housing of all types uh, needs to be more affordable, whether it's uh, single family, whether it's supportive housing uh, for, you know, ex-offenders, helping people get back on their feet, um, whether it's rental, whether it's uh, for sale. Um, so really, you know, this, this concept of, uh, you know, the affordable housing or, yeah, the affordable housing um, uh, legislation here is reflective of what we heard in the comp plan process. And, um, you know, I think uh, that aside from that, we heard that, you know, more people want to get involved in the affordable housing um, uh, process, whether it's helping to fix up existing communities that are existing buildings that are out there. So, you know, one of the ones that kind of is parallel to affordable housing is uh, blight remediation. We do have a lot of, uh, we do have a lot of, uh, you know, row home units out there, uh, relatively cheap, um, but they're in states of disrepair. Like you can buy them relatively cheap, but there's a lot of work that needs to go into them. So, uh, you know, alongside um, the provision of affordable housing, you have to kind of look at, all right, how can people take advantage of, you know, how can we tie this to blight remediation and take advantage of that from an economic development perspective too? Um, and so, you know, I think this probably deals a bit more with just the provision of housing, but ideally what comes out of this is we get more housing development. And what that means is there's more work going on and there's more opportunities, not just for people to uh, find a housing unit for themselves that works and is affordable and quality, uh, but they have an opportunity to get involved in the process of fixing these up and, uh, you know, find uh, opportunities for jobs in that uh, scenario as well. Great. Thank you. Um, and then one last suggestion uh, to Councilman uh, Daniels' uh, point. I think uh, there's a lot of different groups that are working around uh, housing in the region that I think would be a good resource. One is the Capital Area Coalition Against Homelessness. Um, the Capital Region United Way as well. And um, I believe um, the Redevelopment Authority, there's some folks on there that are pretty knowledgeable on housing and these sorts of topics, and then Dauphin County Human Services. Um, I think between those four, we might be able to lock down a percentage that fits uh, the average income of uh, Harrisburg residents. Um, and the other issue is, is that um, it'd be nice if we had current census data. I know that that's sort of getting worked on um, and I don't want to delay this, but I mean, it's just food for thought that once we get the current census data is maybe to come back and see how that jives with what with our uh, program or the resolution. So, um, but that, that's it for me. I would like to get uh, locked down a compromise potentially on the income piece and then figure out this enforcement mechanism. Uh, but yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Councilman Majors, do you have any questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, Council Member Matson and Council Member Daniels asked the question that I was really, uh, uh, that I had really was about the enforcement uh, piece. So I think if we could lock that down, because, you know, I mean, I think we all know if, if there's, you know, if we don't know who, who exactly is going to be doing the enforcement, um, that could lead to some some issues down the road and challenges as we're uh, looking to uh, hold uh, folks accountable uh, through um, through this piece. And um, but I do appreciate all the work that's uh, been done so far. And then, um, but yeah, yeah. So no further questions. Okay, thank you, President Williams. You are on mute. I apologize. I first want to say thank you to the administration. Um, when I first came, got on council, as a member of council, one of my um, priorities is make sure that we have some type of housing, affordable housing piece. Um, Ms. Bowers, I want to thank you because you and I both attended sessions when we were at, con when we had different conferences throughout the nation. Uh, and one of the things what we found out about, you know, affordable housing is that it does not exist here in Harrisburg. So thank you for following through with that. Um, 
I guess my question is, and I'm gonna follow up with um, what Mr. Uh, Majors just said is, what, may, what measures are we gonna put in place in this legislation that will hold these developer, developers accountable for making sure that we do, they do market rate units along with the affordable piece for the individuals who would be um, utilizing that percentage. So that can be to Tiffany or to Nona. You may, can you answer that question? Do we have anything in place in this piece of legislation that we have today? And excuse me, President Williams, I, I'm not quite exactly sure what you're asking. Well, you were, you were indicating that the market rate units, some developers may utilize the market and do the market rate units first. So what measures can we put in place to make sure that the, as they do the market rates, they're doing the affordable uh, piece rates too for sure. the individuals who need affordable housing? Sure. So one of the things that's in this legislation as well is once a developer qualifies and they want their development project to receive the incentives, they actually have to enter into a development agreement with the city of Harrisburg. So it would be a binding agreement. Okay. Um, and then yes, there would have to be some monitoring to make sure that, you know, that, that the affordable housing is being constructed um, at the same rate as the market rate units. And that would be something before they got their certific certificate of occupancy, codes has to go out. Um, that's for all development projects. They would go out and make sure that everything's, you know, up to code and, you know, all, all the building permits were followed, things like that. So that piece I could see being um, codes when they go out um, to give the final sign off. Okay, I would like to see <laughs> in that agreement that uh, the host them accountable, um, put some type of measures from the city of Harrisburg to hold them okay. accountable not just to have the codes people going out and monitoring as they're developing. I could jump in and just on the enforcement piece, Madam President, uh, to, to clarify here, the real, the real hammer that the city has here is if, um, if a developer were to act in good faith to, to promise to um, build affordable housing and then not do it or not keep it up or um, any number of, of things, then then we can revoke the certificate of, of occupancy for the project. So there, there's a, a great power in that. If somebody's going to be spending, you know, a, a lot of money doing a development project and then do, don't and, and qualifies and, and and applies for and enters into a development agreement for affordable housing and then doesn't do what it says it's going to do, they're not going to be able to rent any uh, apartments at that uh at that complex, that's a that that is a strong enforcement piece to ensure that um, that this is complied with, and that would be codes to answer uh, Councilman Ma Madison and Major's uh, concerns. Ultimately, they're the ones that issue the certificate of occupancy, so they could revoke the certificate of occupancy if uh, if if it's warranted. Just that's a huge power, and it should ensure compliance with the program. Well, I want to make sure that we have a huge uh, power too, and put that as a measure enforcement piece in this piece of legislation, Mayor. I do believe the legislation does talk about um, revocation of certificate of occupancy, as well as revert, revoking their certificate of qualification. Okay. Well, I'll look at it. I don't have that available. I usually have the corresponding legislation here on my desk, but I don't have it this evening, my computer is uh, continuously acting up the firewall. It's a firewall and I can't utilize my own computer. So I'm using um, Kirk's computer tonight. So I don't have those legislation pieces here on my desk so I can go over that. But I certainly will look at that and make sure that uh, I do have something, it, that we, the city does have something in place for an enforcement measure. Now, my next question will go to Nona. Uh, Nona, you said you've talked to, you, you did some outreach to developers in the city of Harrisburg. You don't have to give me that information right now, but could you give me a list maybe or a number of how many developers you reached out to? And of, of course, everyone knows the city of Harrisburg is landlocked. So when you're talking about de developing um, affordable housing, my concern, are they going to be utilizing what we have, the housing stock we have here and do renovations to homes? Or will they be looking doing renovations to 
uh, office buildings and converting those into affordable housing piece. Could you answer that question for me, please? Or have you talked about that with the developers? Uh, as you actually, uh, I have not, no, I'm sorry. I have not actually asked that question, but I can find out. Um, I've reached out to a total of 13 uh, developers, but I can find that out for you. Okay, because as I stated before, City of Harrisburg is landlocked, so I like to know where they're going to develop at and what type of housing unit they're going to provide, mm -hmm. uh, or will they be doing as other developers have done to utilize the office buildings and renovate those into um, multi-apartments or townhomes, or will they be using the housing stock that we have here and doing the renovations of some homes in the city of Harrisburg. So just give me some type of statistic if you would speak with the developers again. Okay. What they're okay. looking at. And if they have any future plans of doing any um, housing here in the city in the next six or seven months. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have, Ms. Bowers. And again, thank you, Ms. Bowers, for continuing on with this affordable housing piece. I appreciate all the work that you have put into it. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for all of your feedback. Uh, it is greatly appreciated. Um, I think we've had a great discussion. I think there are um, some points to consider for a possible amendments. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention before we move on to Bill 17, um, Ms. Baldock, you mentioned that there are currently no incentives within the bill for residents, um, such as financial literacy or a credit repair program. Um, and, and I would like to see some incentives added for residents. Um, I think that it's important while we have considered our um, population that are currently renters, I think it's, it's always ambitious and very forward thinking to think about the long term, and it is our goal um, to see our residents move toward home ownership. But we want them to be prepared um, to become successful homeowners. So I personally would like to see some incentives added uh, for our residents. So Another thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just to be clear, so I understand what you're what you're saying. Um, you are talking about some incentives for the actual tenants. Correct. So I th I think when I said I, there weren't. Um, incentives for resident uh, residences, I meant um, home ownership. Okay. But yes, to your point, there are, right, in this, there, there aren't incentives for the actual tenants, it's developer incentives. Okay, thank you. Um, the other thing, oh, I see Councilman. Oh no, go ahead, go ahead and finish first, uh, Chair Bowers, I'm sorry. Okay. Thanks, that's okay. Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask about rather, because I don't think it had come up in any of our previous discussions about this bill, um, and maybe this is another long-term goal, uh, a funding source to sustain the program. I know we talked about the qualifications and those sorts of things, um, but is there any thought or consideration of a funding source to sustain the program. Uh, well, I can jump in. So it's it's incentive based. So it's not actually costing uh, the city anything to do. If, if what you mean is uh, to to sort of cover the administrative costs or the uh, you know for uh, for the enforcement piece or the regulation piece, then. Uh, uh, that is something that we, uh, I think, can do within within the current fines of what we're establishing. It may it may require another administrative uh, position in the Office of Economic Development. For sure, that's something that we've talked about uh, to assist Nona and Jamal uh, in uh, the paperwork as it gets up and running. But uh, I think that these are all things which the, the city can budget for as we move forward. Okay, thank you. That's good to know. Uh, Councilman Majors, you had another question? Uh, yeah. Um, so I guess to the mayor's point on that, and just so I'm clear on the abatement piece, the abatement would be for the entire building or is it just for the units that would qualify for affordable housing? So again, let's just use round numbers, uh, 10 unit building, $10,000 per unit, $100,000, 20% would be uh, 
eligible for the abatement. They'd have two units that'd be 20, you know, say it's $20,000. Would they get a $20,000 relief or would it be the full $100,000 relief for the 10 unit, um, the 10 unit property? Uh, so the abatement would, would work on a project uh, by project basis. So if uh, uh, it wouldn't work on a unit by unit basis, unless you were doing some sort of condo uh, uh, development, which would be a little different. But ge generally speaking, if, uh, uh, if you qualify for the, uh, for the program and you become certified and you enter into the development agreement and you do what you say you're going to do, then you would receive the abatement for the whole project. Uh, so uh, it, it wouldn't, you wouldn't just receive a portion of the abatement for a portion of the project. Okay. Okay. All right. So then, yeah, no. So then again, I think, uh, it would be incumbent upon us to have, a, a, you know, some additional enforcement, you know, provisions and we can you know, look through that. I think some, as to, to Mary's point about, uh, the revocation of their occupancy permit is one thing, sure. um, you know, I just don't want to get into scenarios as which have been discussed before where, you know, we, we, they get through the program and then all of a sudden, you know, the affordable units, you know, take a little bit longer to, to come on board. So uh, yeah, any additional conversation we can have on that piece would be great. And then uh, just some clarification uh, from Chair Bowers in terms of the incentives. And I, I just wasn't clear. Is it incentives for the tenants or is it incentives for current homeowners to, um, to maybe improve property similar to what some of the um, some of the provisions that are in the uh, learner program are for homeowners that do improvements on their their property. I'm just trying to make sure I'm I'm clear on that piece. So in my mind, it would be for the tenants to move toward home ownership. Okay. Um, that's that's my thought. So what that looks like um, as an amendment, I'm not sure yet, but it is something that I think we should consider um, as with a, including in the program as a whole. Okay. And then additionally, um, in terms of timing, I know, you know, you, you definitely, you know, you want to look at some uh, future amendments um, and I don't know if there's going to be any additional outreach to some of the uh, people in the development community, um, you know, just to see if, you know, if they are going to take advantage, because I think one thing that, you know, we learned through the learner program is when we had some of these incentives out there, but they may not be taken advantage of to the extent. And I think this is another way to get more people to uh, look to take advantage uh, of, of this program. But I just want to make sure that, um, you know, just, just as an effort to you know get the word out there about this program. So I think it's a great idea and, and, I, and we need additional affordable housing, but we want to make sure we're getting, um, you know, the max benefit for, you know, the residents and future tenants um, of the, of these developments. Sure, I'm really not in any rush. Um, uh, again, from this discussion this evening, I think we've learned a lot after our first reading, uh, first true reading of the bill. So I am not in a rush. I would like to ensure that this program and the package is very full and effective. Um, so whatever that looks like, if we need to continue to uh, discuss this, if we need to have a special work session, just for this, um, where we could invite maybe some of the developers to share their information uh, or feedback um, publicly. I'm happy to do that, but I really am in no rush. Of course, I would like to see this uh, uh, right. well, at least before the end of the year, end of the year. taking us Absolutely. a year to get here. So, right. um, I, but, but again, I want it to be very much complete and effective if we are going to pursue this. So. Yeah. I concur. Thank you, President Williams. I see your hand. I would also like to see this, you know, uh, concluded before the end of the year, uh, preferably before that. Uh, but also, um, I did want to inquire if we could utilize some CDBG monies uh, for these individuals who would need it with this program, attached to this program. So I will be looking into that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Bowers. You're welcome. So if there are no further questions, comments, or concerns relative to Bill 16, I'd like to move forward with Bill 17. Uh, Mr. Petrosky, if you could please read it into the record, I would appreciate it. Sure. Bill 17 of 2020, 
is an ordinance amending Part 3 of Title Seven, the Zoning Code of the City of Harrisburg to provide certain zoning relief for developments which contain affordable housing dwelling units in the City of Harrisburg to encourage the development of affordable housing throughout the City of Harrisburg. Thank you. I believe Mr. Jeffrey Knight will be speaking to Bill 17 this evening. Uh, yes, is am I a little more clear on my sound? No, yes? A little, you still sound a little distant uh, to me. Okay, uh, well, I'll uh, try and get closer here. Um, so uh, the intention uh, of the um, changes to the zoning code that we have uh, included in uh, this uh, bill um, was to kind of look at the types of um, development standards in the zoning code uh, that we could address through um, offering uh, bonuses uh, to developers who took on, um, sorry, I'm getting a uh, heads up for a moment here, trying to, let's see. Um, my apologies, I'm trying to get to the uh, sound settings here. Uh, moment's trying to help me out. Uh, hopefully, is that is that better? That's much better. Okay, Thank good. You. Uh, all right, thanks, Moment. Um, so, uh, yeah, the intent was to try and identify the parts of the zoning code that might uh, appeal uh, to developers uh, to encourage them to inc incorporate more uh, affordable housing uh, units in their projects, while at the same time not having um, kind of uh, secondary adverse impacts. So um, that's why uh, a lot of what we uh, focused on was um, on something like building height or uh, density, because that way you're not increasing the impervious footprint of development. You know, you're not necessarily uh, encroaching, encroaching into uh, setback areas. So you're, you know, impacting adjacent property owners. Um, it's more about trying to uh, do more with the same amount or do more with less almost kind of um, and so that was really how we approached this. And uh, so the way we, so what we looked at were the uh, density uh, of units, um, the maximum impervious lot coverage, uh, building height, and then uh, off street parking. Um, and so, uh, you know, we tried to uh, be relatively aggressive with um, what we were recommending as far as uh, bonuses. Um, but at the same time, uh, not so much that we would, uh, you know, again, have those adverse impacts on adjacent properties. Like not that we were saying you could build a building twice as large with four affordable units or something like that in there. So that's really the approach um, we took. And uh, we kind of had a very granular approach to that um, in our initial recommendations to Nona. Uh, and then I think in no, and then so Nona took those to, I believe, the developer she spoke with to, uh, you know, other uh, might have shared them with you as well. Um, and uh, I think out of that, we kind of simplified it a little bit, uh, which, you know, I think does uh, does make sense um, because the more complicated, more complex something is, uh, the more difficult it is to administer, um, you know, in a number of different fronts. Um, so uh, that was really, you know, the approach we tried to take here. And, um, we, we tried to back a lot of uh, what we did up with data from uh, census or from, for example, PennDOT or something like that, or HUD. Uh, so, you know, we looked into, um, and that was really with how we addressed uh, the parking issues. So we looked into that and we noted that, you know, people with uh, na both nationally and within the uh, Harrisburg MSA um, with lower incomes had less access to vehicles. So, you know, they, if we're asking people to put in more affordable units and there will be more people with lower incomes in a, in a development, then there's less of a likelihood they're gonna bring, you know, the same numbers of cars as, you know, a market rate unit, for example. So we tried to, you know, take that data and say, how can we do something that's both good planning and, uh, you know, both good for the neighborhood that they're in and, also, and good for the developers and then also good for uh, the people who will now have access to a greater number of affordable units. Um, in addition to doing those, uh, we also kind of tinkered around with some of the um, 
with some of the uh, uh, ancillary parts of the zoning code, like our accessory dwelling units. Um, so that's something we wanted to look at in addition uh, in, to include in this, um, which was, uh, you know, trying to make that a little bit easier to do so somebody could have like an in-law unit, for example, while not maybe having to go through the same hoops as a developer looking to put two units on a property. Um, and, you know, we would make sure that those homes are like owner occupied and things of that nature. So that was where we started from the planning bureau uh, when we were looking at how do we adopt our, uh, adapt our current zoning code um, to both encourage new development, but also encourage development uh, that's uh, good planning and that uh, would make projects, you know, good neighbors. Sounds good, thank you. And I, I just wanted to refresh my colleague's memory. Um, I think I talked about it again a year ago, but the concept of density bonus is, um, it's, it's a helpful tool used to address affordable housing. Um, some of our neighboring municipalities like Lancaster um, and Pittsburgh, they've successfully implemented a density bonus. Um, so just for some context, Ms. Watson, I didn't know if you had anything that you'd like to share relative to Bill 17. Okay, thank you. So at this time, I will open it up for questioning from my colleagues. Let's see, I will begin with Councilwoman Daniels. Do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, so, um, so logistically, yeah, I'm looking at the changes to the zoning code. Um, logistically, we're basically going to be looking at two zoning codes, right? One for a building that does receive the affordable housing certificate and one that doesn't. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say um, it's two zoning codes. It's one zoning code. It's, uh, but anybody um, has the option of opting in uh, to this program. And by opting in, um, you are committing to both affordable units, but that also gives you uh, by right, you know, a density increase, or you might have to uh, provide uh, less parking on site. Um, so that's uh, kind of the um, intent is that it's, you know, this opt-in system where in it for providing a community benefit in terms of affordable housing, um, you're getting uh, a little bit more latitude within the zoning code. Um, I wouldn't say that they were like parallel zoning codes or anything like that though. Okay. Um, and I think that's it. I just have to go through all of the you know, the special exemptions and the permitted by right. Um, but I, I think that's it for me. Okay, thanks. Uh, Councilman Madsen, do you have any questions? Yeah, again, I'm uh, happy that the bonus density got put in there. I know in the preliminary discussions over the summer, we talked about bonus density and looking at what Lancaster was doing. So I'm happy to see that this was put into a resolution as well. Um, I'm pretty familiar with bonus density. I'm not gonna attest to being an expert on it, but uh, I do, um, I don't have any questions at the moment. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Uh, Councilman Majors, any questions? Yes, uh, so just one question is, I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, the off street parking incentives uh, section, on, looks like it's line 179 is where it starts and goes through um, line 182. Uh, and it looks like it's going to be referencing the affordable housing certification. Uh, and I was just wondering why there was a, uh, that the incentive goes for if you have 25% of affordable housing dwelling units versus the 20%, which is in the um, affordable housing piece. I'm just trying to understand why there's that, that difference there in terms of when the incentive kicks in for the off street parking. I think maybe Tiffany or Nona can speak to that. Sure, I, I think for parking relief, you know, parking, well, parking is always a, a hot issue in the city. 
mm-hmm. that we wanted to bump that requirement. You know, you have to hit a little bit higher of a threshold um, in order to qualify for the parking incentive. Okay. All right. No, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I just was making, just making sure I'm, you know, following there. Uh, Cause you're right. I think in, as we're in providing these density bonuses, um, you know, parking is still going to remain a, a, a difficult issue. And, and while people may not have access to, to vehicles, um, maybe one or one person or you know, two people in that you know, one person may have a car and, and or, you know, using some, uh, a car or you know a used vehicle and, and it still will be you know taking up some space and you know, parking is uh, a, ver- a very uh you know touchy subject and we all you know, are experiencing it even more now with as we're going through this winter storm uh so just want to make sure that um th- that's been taken into account um outside of that i think uh you know i think the density bonus is is okay but we do need to take in, in, in that into consideration uh, so no further questions right now thank you you're welcome thank you uh, Vice President Allett. I don't have any questions at this time. Um, I, I am glad that we're moving in this direction too. So I, um, but nothing pops in mind that I wanted to ask at this point. So thank you. Welcome, thanks. President Williams, any questions? You're on mute again. <laughs> That's Kirk's in here too. <laughs> No, I don't, not at this time, but I, I do know that um, we, we probably need to have additional uh, sessions regarding this uh, to, for, up, you know, for up, uh, maybe it's about two or three more for discussion because there are some things, because um, this, this piece fits with Bill 16. And I certainly uh, need to look at this. I don't have hard copies. I generally do have hard copies in front of me. So I don't have access to hard copies. And as I indicated earlier, I'm using Kurt's computer. So I certainly will have additional questions. I don't want this to be the first and last of the session, you know, concerning these two pieces of legislation. So I just hope that you'll have additional, you know, work sessions to discuss these two pieces. And President Williams, just as a point of clarity and also for uh, Councilwoman Bowers, as this is a, um, this particular bill is a zoning amendment. It does require a public hearing and special advertising before it gets approved. I just wanted to put that out there. I know we've had Councilwoman Bowers, we've had this discussion. I just wanted to make that clear for anyone listening. If they think that we are not abiding by the municipality's planning code, this will get a public hearing at at some point. I know, Ms. Uh, Thank you, Cliff. I did see that on the agenda here for the meeting agenda, but I just wanted to make sure that we leave this open for additional questions or comments that the residents may have in the city of Harrisburg, okay? But I do, I know I'm gonna have additional questions. I don't have, as I stated before, I don't have the legislation in front of me, but I would like to uh, look at it in the next coming days. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowers. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Ms. Baldock for that reminder and for letting everyone know. Um, okay, so that concludes, if there are no further questions, concludes Bill 17. Um, colleagues, if you uh, have time to review the bills further. If you come up with any other questions in the interim, please let me know. Again, I would really like this to be a complete package. Um, So I am fine with um, hosting whatever we need to do to make sure that that happens. Next on the agenda, we have resolution four of 2021. Mr. Petrosky, if you could please read that into the record. The resolution four of 2021 is a resolution approving a substantial amendment to the city of Harrisburg 2019-2020 annual action plan to incorporate new activities and funding to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic as provided for by the CARES Act. Thank you. I believe Ms. Williams is present to provide an overview. Yes, good evening, everyone. Um, Can we put my um, PowerPoint up, please? So everyone can follow along and see um, what I'm looking at, you guys can look at. And if you have any questions, um, you can let me know at that time. Lily, who is who has the PowerPoint? Um, I sent it to Kurt. Kurt. 
You have the PowerPoint. He'll be right with you, Miss Williams. Thank you. I'm going to send it to you now, Moment. I could send it to Moment right now if you would like, uh, President Williams. Yes. It may, it may be quicker. Yes, would you please? Because I, I think he's, uh, he's having a problem. You did? Yep, I just received it. Uh, give me one moment here. Okay. Yeah, I just, I'm, I'm on my, my phone, unable to share it, but I just sent it to Moment. He should be sharing it shortly. Thank you. Okay, we're ready. Okay, moment. Can you start it at page 10? Because it started off at uh, 2020. And I'm going to start with. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. For, sorry for the confusion. Um, this evening, I would like to do um, introduce the CARES Act amendment for CDBG COVID fund round three. Um, the only difference, um, the changes that we have here is um, if, if you can turn to page 11, moment. Okay, right here that's uh, in red, we have due to additional funding and available waivers to address COVID-19 impact to the community. Um, page 12, on round three, we received, we received an additional fund of $464,497 of COVID funds for round three. Um, on page 13, it gives a breakdown of what we would like to use the money for. It's in red where it says CDBG COVID funding for Harrisburg and the amount underneath. You will see the city will utilize the CDBG COVID funds in the following ways. $371,598 will go towards public service that prevent, prepare, and respond to COVID. Uh, we did get a 15% uh, cap waived. So HUD has waived that for us. So we don't have any penalties or we don't have any caps that we have to follow. We can put that funds into um, the public service and help out as many people in need as possible. $92,899 is for the administrative purposes. That's what we have to have put aside the 20% put aside for um, when we have any funds our um, CDBG funds that we have to have. Uh, page 14, please. This just gives the breakdown that has not changed, that has already been um, approved that for the ESG COVID funds for round one and round two, I just wanted to show the information that has already been approved. So um, you would know that that's been approved in the amounts. Page 15 is there has not, not been anything changed there. However, I just wanted to show, hello?
Yes, we can hear you. Oh, Read. my my screen went black. I don't know why. Um, sorry. Let me. My screen went black. Um, so uh, for 2019 act, annual action plan goals, um, nothing has changed there. However, I did want to show again what has that already been approved and what uh, we are currently using and uh, give a breakdown of that. I'm sorry, I'm charging up my charger. Maybe that's why my screen went black, I'm sorry. Um, for the next page, we have the 2019 um, CARES Act mm -hmm. Amendment Funds. This shows the different breaks down, breakdown as well. Um, there you will see uh, for the COVID funds included, the, the COVID round three funds included, you'll see the uh, $1,617,474 1, and the round three was included in that total amount for co CDBG COVID funds, which in total, which is the $3,555,828. So there you will be able to see that as well. And that is the change. There has been no other changes besides uh, the round three. The next page mm -hmm. um, breaks down the set number seven, eight and nine are also the changes that we have. And for the administrative cost, that was the 92,000 that I had already um, explained. Um, that is the, uh, the minute the 20% and then the COVID, uh, the, e, the CDBG CV funds is the $371 or I'm sorry, 371,598 dollars that we already um, have as well. So that's the only changes there. For page 18, this just gives the next steps on what we have to do. We have to submit the information to um, HUD, letting them know that we did introduce the, have the public hearing and introduce the information to city council. And that's all that that concludes for the amendment of 2019. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Williams for your presentation. Thank you. I don't have any immediate questions. I think um, your presentation was very clear with the red of what had changed. Um, so I don't have any questions at this time, but I will open it up to my colleagues to see if they have any. Uh, we'll begin with Vice President Allett. Do you have any questions? I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. President Williams, any questions? Uh, yes, um, Ms. Williams, how are you today? Thank you so much for the presentation. You. Um, can you just give us an overview of how we allocated that money, where we're at and what status we're at with that, the allocation? I think the public would uh, like to hear that because there's many questions regarding the reallocation of the money for uh, rental reimbursement, mortgage reimbursement and utilities. So that they would, so that they could get a, a view of how we're spending the money and where we're at actually, and how many applications we received. Okay, so as of right now, we have uh, five hundred thousand um, dollars put in for the rental rental assistance program, which is also the rent relief program. Mm -hmm. um, as of right now, we received six hundred and three applications. Um, currently, we have processed and approved 200 um, applications and $122,000, um, I'm sorry, $122,904.15 has went out. Um, we are currently in a, um, uh, processing another 50. We do 50 every two weeks. Um, it has been, um, we're very thankful that the um, residents have cooperated with us, getting us information. The landlords have been getting us information. It's been very important that we get rent ledgers to make sure that um, it has the uh, the rent has been backed up since COVID has taken place. Um, so as of right now, we're in the process of 
uh, processing another 50. We did process uh, and approve right now 15 and that totals to 62,000. So for this pay period, or I'm sorry, this check run coming up next week. Okay. Um, so that's another 62,000 and we're not even done yet. So it should be higher um, by Thursday. Okay. So we're, we're very excited for that. Of when we were, because I know a lot of people have called your office you know, inquiring about where the status of their application was. So the public needed to know that, you know, we're continuously working on the applications that, you know, as, as effectively as we can and, and expeditiously as we can too, as well. Absolutely. And I've been receiving a lot of calls. And so I wanted to make sure that the public understands that we are still continuing to uh, process allocation checks to the different utilities and the landlords. Absolutely. And we did we did send out uh, letters and, and or emails just letting the residents know and the landlords know where we stand and where they stand at in the application process. Okay, thank you. Thank you for all your hard work because I know it's been a task so far. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowers. You're welcome. I do have uh, two follow-up questions relative to the uh, rental relief program. I was wondering if you could uh, you mentioned the maximum award amount was $5,000. Um, did you, are you aware of the average rent check that's been approved? So yes, uh, as you said, $5,000 per house, up to $5,000 per household. The average check that we send out for rent is uh, $2,006.72. Um, and then in utilities, the average has been three eighty one thirty six. dollars Thank you. That was my next question. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Let's see, uh, Councilwoman Daniels, do you have any questions? Uh, no, the presentation was pretty clear. Okay, you. you're welcome. Thank you, Councilman Madsen. Any questions? Uh, one, and I don't know that Ms. Williams can really answer it. Um, I just was kind of curious while we we're on the topic of the CARES dollars and allocating to support small businesses. Do we know how the small businesses are doing? But you know, largely, I kind of drive through and see if businesses are still open, but I know that's largely anecdotal. Uh, is there any kind of hard data we can measure to see how they're doing just so we kind of know how, how many CARES dollars may need to be appropriated or how that how, what that's going to look like? Well, what I can tell you is that, and maybe Nona can help out with this question because Nona and I are working together with this along with Credic. Um, we have set aside $500,000 to help with small businesses. Um, right now we're in the process of get, getting information and the, um, the invoices for the um, businesses that have been approved. So as of right now, we're, um, I sent the uh, contract agreement to Nona and she's going to be sending it to the business so we can make sure that they follow the compliance side of it. And then uh, once the invoices have been sent to me, we will process checks for payments. Okay, thank you. I just didn't know, maybe, and then I know this is maybe a larger conversation, maybe I'll follow up with Jamal, just kind of wondering, are we seeing an uptick in mercantile licenses, for example, or are they going down, or what's the situation with our small businesses, just so we have a scope or an idea of what was happening, or how significant the economic damage from COVID has been. But I'll, I'll follow up with Jamal on all that. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Councilman Manson, this is Jamal here. Uh, just to, to that question, just wanted to, to share your uh, over the uh, over 2020, uh, actually, mercantile uh, licenses uh, applied for an issue. To actually, uh, uh, we saw a, a slight increase uh, over over years past. So, uh, right now, can't quite pinpoint exactly what led to that. Uh, possibly, uh, just with uh, COVID-19, there were individuals that uh, found opportunities to you know to to carve out a niche for themselves and go into business for themselves. So, just in a, a period where uh, you know many businesses actually. Uh, closed or or uh, either either uh, permanently or, or or partially, uh, there there were uh, opportunities for individuals to uh, to start new businesses as well. So we did actually see a, a slight uptick in uh, mercantile licenses issue. Wow, that's encouraging. Very good. Well, let's uh, keep them up. <laughs> All right, thank you. That's it for me. Thank you, um, Councilman Majors. Any questions? Uh. Yes. Um, well, thank you both, uh, Lily, Jamal, and, and Nona for, for this. Um, I, and President Williams made a, a, a good point in getting some of that information on how, uh, how the uh, rental assistance program is, because uh, I think all of us are getting comments and, or, or questions about that. Um, 
I think one thing that could be beneficial, uh, at least from my perspective, is if we could get, um, since you are doing them every two weeks, if we can just get a, a brief email that, that does that run through of what you just did, which is just the applications, the number that are being processed, you know, how many are left over, and even how many um, were denied, because I think there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion out there in, our, in the community about, hey, I applied and I haven't heard anything, or I applied and, and I was denied, and um, I know that there are income limits and, and you know, certain qualifications that you have to have in terms of um, where, you know, the type of dwelling that you're in that can, can qualify. So some of that information, um, whether it's, you know, two members of council, so we can uh, try to you know, help on the messaging piece or if it's on on uh, the uh, building and housing website, just so that people have um, access to that information. Because I think a lack of information, a lack of, you know, people, the community knowing, then people start, um, you, know, you know, I guess uh, they they fill in the gaps for themselves rather than getting the, the accurate information. Um, so that'll be helpful. Um, and I, I guess just one piece, I guess one question on, on the document did say that, is it, is, was the 500,000 going to the Department of Community Economic Development or the Mayor's Office of Economic Development? I, I just, when I was reading through that, it just, um, I wasn't aware that there was a specific mayor's office of economic development. So I'm just trying to um, clarify where those funds went. And um, I guess at the, the appropriate time, if we can get a list of those businesses that would, um, that received a uh, funding through CDBG. Um, so I have um, started sending Dan, uh, Councilwoman uh, Daniels the, um, the, the stats for the rent relief. I started that for the first week that already went out. Um, okay. What I did and I did send to um, President Williams. So what I will do is I can add you onto that as well, if you would like, um, but I'm sending them every two weeks. Once we process, I just send updates to them as well. Um, I do have the number for uh, who has been denied has been 116 people so far has been denied. 108 of them are because they are out of city limits. Okay. Uh, so that was the majority is, and a lot of people get upset because they think that they see Harrisburg and they think that that's in this, they, they confuse the two and they think, okay, well, I live in Harrisburg. So that's the city. Unfortunately, right. we, we have to explain to them uh, what school does your children go to? And that's how we kind of help them understand right. it. And then, you know, they understand, but you know, people don't understand that it has to be inside of city limits. Yeah. Agree. And again, I just think just again, for clarity purpose, could you just reiterate the denials and how many were outside of the city? 108 were outside of the city. Mm -hmm. Seven of them were rooming houses. Okay. And one was uh, due to uh, the person was over the income limit of one person. Um, they made $60,000 and they no longer received tips. Okay. The COVID, so they didn't qualify. Okay. So then, so then it's safe to, so then it's to say that there were eight individual, eight applications that were in the city of Harrisburg that were denied. Yes. Yes. Of, and the old overall number again that are being processed, just so I'm clear. 200 right now. 200. So 200 were processed, eight were denied. No, 200 were processed and okay. approved. Okay. 116 were denied. Okay. And as of right now, every two weeks, we do 50 being processed at every two weeks. Okay. Okay. So of the, so that's, I guess, 316, if my numbers are correct, eight were city residents that were denied. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, and I, again, I think to me, to me, some making some of those, getting some of that information out there is, is crucial because, you know, it is city residents that are, um, that are eligible um, and I'm glad. So, and then of the applications that still need to be processed, we don't know if they're city residents or not. They're just still, well, or, we looked or did, you, did, you, did, you, you did that first suite to remove? Yes, okay. exactly. That's exactly what we did just to make sure that we went through them to make sure who were city residents, who weren't, who was in the income limits. Just that's why it took us a little bit longer because we went through that process first. Okay, absolutely, and 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 I, I greatly appreciate that um, that clarity. Uh, and I don't know if Moman can pull up the slide again. I just on the, the slide that you had for how the remainder 
how the new money's being spent, or could you just do a quick overview of that? Okay. Um, so um, I did want to just say one thing before we get off this. A lot of people are getting confused. This the city, the county's assistance program, rent mm -hmm. relief, and this our our program. There are two different programs because I I do get a lot of calls saying that we just let the money go out there and not use it. That is incorrect. Our program, we are using all the funds and we're working hard to get this money out to help the, you know, the residents and the landlords as well. So I just okay. wanted to make that you know, known. Okay, and then to that point, um, is, could someone have applied for the county program and the city program and received benefits in both if, programs or would it, or they cancel the program? Benefits. It cannot be a duplicate of benefits. That's one thing it cannot be. If they received uh, federal uh, funds, and I have uh, Eric, our uh, consultant on, um, Eric Chatham, that if you have additional questions that I can't answer, but if it's a duplication of benefits, we cannot pay it twice. So if they receive funds, federal funds, we, we wouldn't, CDBG funds, COVID funds, we couldn't pay that twice. Okay. And that's one of the questions that we do ask on the application. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. Okay. So you wanted me to just break down the amounts? Yeah. Just the, just the, for the new dollars okay. that were in red. I just, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So for um, number seven, it has the CDBG COVID administrative for, um, for co uh, the CDBG COVID round three, and that's 92,000. $899 is the administrative 20% uh, that we have to take. The CDBG public service, which we no longer have a cap for um, due to um, HUD waiving that is the $371,598. The total, as you can see for both of them is uh, with the 92 for the administrative number seven is $323,494. And then for the public services, $793,980. And then for the CDBG, CV, CBA, that's a, the $500,000 for the economic development of small businesses. Right. But that was from the original, that was from the yeah. earlier round. We're just talking, yeah. the, the two rounds are the public service piece and the administration piece yeah. are the new dollars. Yes. And I think there was an earlier slide that had the public service breakdown. Can we go to that? One more. One more. Yep. Take this over to you. Uh, this will okay. break it down too, but there should be, I think it's like the third page moment. Up. Lily, I, forgive me. I don't think you have a breakdown of the public services just yet. No. No, he's talking to uh, Councilman. Bates. Yeah, I think it was on, it was on page yeah, 13. Minutes. Yeah, the page 13 which has, so it's it's this piece here on page 13, which is the city will utilize CDBG CB3 funding in the following ways. The 371, 598 for public services that prevent, prepare and respond to COVID-19 and the 15% cap waiver still applies. What I'm asking is how are we defining the public services that prevent and what would those funds be utilized for? Okay, so the public services that uh, we are preventing, um, Eric, can you break down that for me? You, at this time, you have not received any applications from outside agencies for those funds. So if that remains true, then um, the, the potentially all of those funds could be available for rental assistance. So that could go towards more of funds for the rental assistance program. Okay, and then, so, so it could, that is one potential use, but in terms of public services, so are we accepting applications from outside entities? So, you know, nonprofits that uh, are looking to potentially, I don't know, receive, you know, apply for PPE, uh, you know, testing, you know, et cetera, with this, these funds, or is it, or is the intent for it to be used for additional um, rent relief? So, uh, we are still in um, discussions. Um, however, we will be um, doing another round. However, we're not we're not 
I'm not sure yet the amount that we're going to use for the, the next go around, the second round of rent relief funds. Okay. And, and, and Councilman Majors, if I can add to that, um, last year when we allocated the first round, the CV1, um, we had just allocated the regular entitlement funds, if you will, to our typical public service agencies. Many of those agencies, because of COVID and, and things being so shut down through most of the year last year, they were actually weren't able to deliver the program they had intended to in the first place, at least mm -hmm. not in the same manner. So right. what many of them were able to do is just hang on to that money that was already allocated, but modify how they delivered. So we had several agencies that went to virtual type work. They needed uh, laptops and, and other equipment to make their uh, services viable. So we offered at that point that they could request for a modification in their scope or modification in, in the line items of their budgets and potentially ask for additional funds. So we, we took that into account in the first round Right now, most of our CDBG funded public service agencies have not utilized all the money that's already been allocated. So we're not so sure that they, quite frankly, need too much more money for things like PPE or other modifications. Um, at this time, we, we for, for HUD to release the, sec, the third round, CDBG CB3, we don't quite have to have that level of detail so we're trying to go ahead and get HUD approval and release that money. And then we can con continue to work with the specific uses, but primarily it, it's likely to go to rental assistance. Okay. Yeah, not, uh, okay. I understand. And I'm just trying to make sure that, you know, we have a, there's some understanding of where those, those funds um, will go. Okay. I understand. Um, thank and for you. what it's worth, we're, we're, about to the time to start asking agencies how they'd like to uh, to apply for the 2021 funds. Right. So, so we're about to get another cycle of money coming up here in just a few months that will be that there will be an application cycle again for those. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to make sure that we are uh, that we end up fully utilizing all of the funds that we've received um, over this uh, you know these few amendments. Uh, you know because don't want to be returning money to, to, to the federal government if we can't, uh, if we can, you know, avoid that, um, since we know that there are several, you know, there are a lot of folks that are in need uh, in, in our community right now through COVID. So thank you. Thank you. And Lily, if I can jump in, since we've got this up on the screen and to Councilman Major's earlier point, uh, we don't want to use the term MOED on any uh, communication. There is no Mayor's Office of Economic Development. That's an old term and one that uh, doesn't sit well with a lot of people historically in Harrisburg. I, I know what you're trying to mean by that, but uh, it's not the right terminology. My apologies. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, that was, yep, you're correct, Mayor. It was just a terminology phrase. It just, I, again, seeing it on that document, just, I was like, okay, just want to make sure we're, we're all on the same page. So, no problem. My yeah. apologies. I hadn't seen it before, Lily. If you'd shown it to me, I would have given you the same feedback. Thanks. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions, comments, concerns relative to resolution four? I, I have one last question. Oh. Okay. Uh, and sorry if this was already touched on or gone over, but with um, you know expanded vaccinations becoming a thing, is there any way we as a local municipality can help with that or use these dollars to help with vaccinations as it kind of enrolls and we get guidelines from the federal government or is that just a completely separate thing? Uh, uh, the, we could, uh, we can um, use CDBG, CDBG uh, CB funds for um, administering the vaccine to residents. Um, we definitely, that would be an eligible expense that we could use. Mayor, do we want to delve into those waters or is that a separate conversation or? Uh, it might be a conversation for later. Right now, the vaccine uh, isn't available and to the extent it would be available, there's no cost with it. So, uh, but potentially you could use the, you could use the resources to help uh, partner with the vaccine providers to get the word out or to have a staging area for a mass, mass vaccination. I think we're, we're not there yet, but uh, it's a good conversation to have. Okay, 
Thank you. That's it. Uh, Ms. Bowers, one yes. more question. Uh, Ms. Williams, uh, could you tell us the amount that uh, we still have to allocate out to the uh, residents of the city of Harrisburg under this rental program? Okay, let me do the math. Sorry about that. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you might have that available. I just want to assure the residents that we do have a percentage of money that's left to be able to assist them. Sure. We have uh, $377,095.85. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate that information. Thank sure. you, Ms. Bowers. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Um, our final resolution for this evening is Resolution 5 of 2021. Uh, Mr. Petrosky, if you could please read that into the record. A resolution 5 of 2021 is a resolution approving the 2020 annual action plan for the city of Harrisburg necessary to the community development block grant program, CDBG, home investment partnership program, home and emergency solutions grant ESG programs. Thank you. I'll defer to Ms. Williams again. Okay, so a moment, if you can put the PowerPoint um, for the first page of 2020 now, please. <clears throat> and this just breaks down the 2020 new allocations that we received for year uh, October 1st, uh, 2020 to September 30th, uh, 2021. Okay, so this just breaks down, as I said, the consolidated plan is, is, min is ministered through the consolidated plan and through and management through HUD Integrated Disbursement and Information System, which is IDIS online that we uh, submit information to um, HUD. Um, it's live information. The con plan and the annual action plan helps grantees determine activities and organizations to fund in the coming years. The con plan is five years in length and describes community needs, resources, priorities, and propose activities to the undertaking under certain HUD programs. The annual action plan is submitted to HUD every year during a five-year comp plan cycle. The action plan describes the specific plan uses for HUD programs as well as certain other programs and requirements. Next page, please. Thank you. Uh, for the new year uh, 2020 action plan anticipated funds for CDBG, uh, it, it will be a total of $1,974,656. Home would be a total of $489,839. ESG is $167,683. The program income for CDBG in-home is $15,000 for both. Uh, this is anticipated loan payments that we anticipate that we're going to receive for the year. It could be higher, um, but this is what we, was an average that we're receiving. Next page, please. This just tells that the city has held a public comment review period from January, January 20th, 2021 to January 26th, 2021 to give the public an opportunity to review and make comments on the draft plan. A virtual public hearing will be held, which is tonight, February 2nd, 2021, to present the action plan and give the public an opportunity to review and make comments on the draft plan as well. The consolidated plan priority needs, uh, we have uh, affordable rental, rental housing development, Number two, affordable home ownership housing development. Number three, affordable housing homeowner rehabilitation. Number four, affordable housing down payment assistance. And number five, public service. Number six, public facility and, act and infrastructure. Number seven, demolition and blight removal. Number eight, homelessness and housing services. And number nine, economic development. Annual, plan, annual action plan goals as well. Number one, 
community development and public improvements. Number two, public service. Number three, blight and demolition. Number four, increase and preserve affordable housing. Number five, reduce homelessness. And number six, administration. And that's NA right there. This here, uh, it's the 2020 action plan projects and funding just breaks down everything that I have uh, listed in, in the previous pages. The CDBG, CDBG administration is $391,931. The CDBG section 108 loan repayment is $244,031. The CDBG public facility and infrastructure is 500,000. The CDBG housing program, which is the HRP and HIP program that we have, and that's $287,586. Number uh, five, CDBG demolition is 200,000. Number six is CDBG public service, $351,108. Number seven, home administration is $47,484. And number eight is home non-choto housing development, and that's $442,355. And last but not least is number nine, ESG 20-Harrisburg is $167,683, and that's what it includes for the 2020 um, action plan. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this portion of your presentation. Thank you. We'll open it up to my colleagues for any questions. I'll start with Councilman Madsen. Do you have any questions relative to the action plan? No, not at this time, but if I think any, I will submit them in writing to the administration. Thank you. Okay, thanks. President Williams, any questions? No, I don't. Thank you, Ms. Bowers. You're welcome. Councilman Majors, any questions? Uh, thank you. No, no questions on the, um, on, uh, on, on the home piece. And as Mr. Madsen said, if I have any questions, I'll put them in writing. Excellent. Thank you. Vice President Allen, any questions? No questions right now, thank you. You're welcome. Councilwoman Daniels, any questions? No questions, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Williams, for your presence and for your assistance um, in your presentations relative to uh, both of the resolutions. I would like to move forward with resolution four of 2021 and resolution five of 2021. Um, I would request that they be added to our next legislative session agenda for a vote. This concludes the work of the Building and Housing Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowers. Moving on to public comment. Um, Mr. Petrosky, is Melman going to do the public comment? I can do it. I, I see we have uh, four attendees. Four attendees. Uh, if anyone is interested in participating in the public comment, could you please raise your hand at this time and I will unmute you. Last call for public comment. If anyone is interested, please uh, raise your hand at this time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Retrasi. At this point, we'll move for an adjournment, please. Have a motion to adjourn. So moved. I'll move on. In a second. 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 Thank you very much, council members. Good evening. Have a safe journey back uh, travels if you are not at home and the meeting is officially adjourned.